Welcome back to our final session uh, for this day's event. And for those of you who have not uh, been through this before, I guess that's the freshman, uh, the way that this is conducted is something very similar to what you see in an academic uh, conference. A person would present a paper and then there would be a panel uh, of colleagues or experts who respond to the paper as a way to uh, help the, 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 the writer of the paper, to improve the paper, and also as a way to stimulate discussion uh, about the topic at hand. So what we're doing now is um, a, a panel discussion. We're going, we have three panelists, and each of them will present a, a response to the lecture, short response, four or five minutes. And then we're going to let Dr. Roberts respond to their uh, comments. So there's, there's kind of a give and take. And then what we'll do is turn to the questions that you all generated in your discussion groups and allow Dr. Roberts to, to take on those questions, but also uh, hopefully that other members of the panel will engage with the questions as well. So this will take the form something of a, of a conversation between the people here at the table and with you via your questions. Uh, so with that, um, we're going to start with Dr. McGrath, then uh, Dr. Estep, and finally Dr. Grell. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I want to thank Dr. Roberts for an inspirational faith and reason lecture and say that it was beautifully written. He successfully used his vocation in the service of the Lord today. Uh, as a lowly physicist whose vocation views God's creation through a largely physical lens, uh, I found only one thing to quibble with concerning Dr. Roberts' paper. Uh, it was his use of infinity. <laughs> Let me set the record straight. Uh, infinity is not a number, and it isn't restricted to being only incredibly large. Uh, I seriously doubt I was selected to be on this panel to object to the usage of infinity or make a case for calculus in the common core as a way to come closer to God by studying the concept of infinity. Uh, I admit I spent some time wondering why I was asked to be on this panel when so many others here at the college would have something far more scholarly to say and could give fascinating metaphysical insights. Uh, instead, you're stuck with me. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, so I found out last week that I was going to be on this panel, and in the quietness of an evening ride uh, through open hay fields and some woodland paths this weekend, I realized that being on this panel was an opportunity for me to share with you uh, my ideas of vocation and passions. God has blessed each of us with a set of unique passions, and I believe God has asked us to discover these passions as he uses them to teach us. The word passion comes from the Latin pati, to suffer. I believe God uses our passions knowing that because we love them and that in spite of any suffering, we'll come back to them and therefore through them he can teach us. If we weren't passionate about something, then when the obstacles arose, we would quit and no lesson could be learned. By coming to a liberal arts college with a common, common, with a common core, you're learning about what you are passionate about. You're discovering gifts God has bestowed upon you. You may already learn, have learned some of them before you arrived, but you will be learning about many more. And as you pick a vocation, you want that vocation to reflect some of your passions. In this way, your vocation causes you to seek your with God life in the physical world. As Dr. Roberts said in the lecture, God intends for us to be with him and he with us. In my life, God gave me a number of passions. Among them was the curiosity about the physical world he created for us and a passion for horse riding, as many of you know. This is gonna be hard for me. So my passion for the physical world eventually led to my vocation and my passion for horse riding, the source of creativity. And it gave me an intimate relationship with God. The way God worked on teaching me faith was a sport called endurance riding. It's a ridiculous sport. 
It's where one horse and rider go 100 miles in a day or up to 250 miles over five days. It isn't done on a racetrack, but rather on trails out in the wilderness in God's garden. Riding 100 miles in a day could take nearly 24 hours. After that, you're eliminated, depending upon the course. Riding 50 miles a day for five days straight involved anywhere from riding eight to 12 hours a day. And you ride much of this alone. From Psalm 50, for every beast of the forest is mine, and I know all the birds in the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. And so the horse is his. So my favorite pastime while I was riding was to memorize poetry, Shakespeare soliloquies to sound intelligent, famous speeches, and of course passages from scripture. When I did ride with people, and it was an opportunity for all of us to share things that we had memorized since the last time that we had met on the trail. But it was riding at night where I really learned about my faith with God. Riding along at a fast trot or a canter in the darkness, when you don't see well, you have really no vision, on a poorly marked trail, and it was mentally challenging. Initially, I found it stressful, but then I realized it was an opportunity to become closer to God. God asks us to believe in him, a being that transcends space and time, a being who is omnipotent and omnipresent and imminent. What he does through the horse at night while riding is to ask us to have faith in his creation, the horse, as our partner. We have to trust the horse who sees well at night because we have lost our ability of sight at night. We have to learn to go and have faith that we can trust in God's creation. The horse is a physical entity we can see, touch, smell, hear. If we can't learn to trust God's physical creation and have faith that the horse will look after us in the middle of the wilderness, then how will we be able to trust God who I can't physically see or touch? How does the horse find an unmarked trail in the dark in a place that we have never been? I trust the horse and that I are watched. I trust that the horse and I are watched over God and he has never let me down. What was so hard was on a ride to the Tevis Cup one year that I lost my close companion, Snow Dragon. I felt, so this close companion is how I felt close to God on those thousands of miles on dark nights. And he passed away on one of the races. And for what? Was it for a ribbon, a passing human glory? a position on the U.S. World Equestrian Team, these were all ridiculous. And days later, I remembered from James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And so God did. What I learned was that I no longer needed the crutch of the endurance rides for conversations with God. That God could be present in my daily life. I came to realize that to be fulfilled in my vocation, eventually that I needed a place where my faith could be shared with my vocation. And the Lord brought me here to PHC. Thank you. So like my colleague, Dr. McGrath, I deeply enjoyed the lecture this morning and could very easily sum it up by saying, thank you, that was amazing. But since I've been asked to talk a little longer than that, I will. Um, like Dr. McGrath, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a professional theologian, but I am a Christian and that has given me some experiences I wanted to share with you and um, touch on some of the points in the talk. So one thing I really appreciated um, Dr. Roberts bringing up was the idea of scripture memorization. And that goes alongside study, but in the past year I've really 
learned why scripture memorization is so important. Um, in order for us to be disciples who are walking in accordance with God's word, we have to have it in our hearts. And while that can be done by studying it without memorizing, um, there's just another layer that adds. So I think one of the footnotes, um, Dr. Roberts mentioned Joshua 1.8, um, the words of this book shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. So to have the words of the book in our mouths requires that we hide them in our hearts, um, we memorize. And this was really brought home to me um, during the early days of the pandemic because humans react to crises in interesting ways. And um, one of the ways I found I reacted to it was that it was hard to sit down and study the scriptures um, when you're sort of running on adrenaline, wondering what the world's going to do next. <laughs> um, but fortunately, a couple months prior, God had really impressed on me the need to start memorizing scripture more intently and I had started working on that topical memory system by the navigators. So in times when I found it really hard to sit down and study the scriptures the way I normally would, um, I could just, you know, be walking or running or driving and, and just over and over go through all the scriptures that were in my heart. And that's a way that God can really form his character in us um, I don't know if you all have seen the, the word hand illustration by the navigators, but it's this illustration where the four fingers of a hand are things like reading and listening, um, studying and memorizing, and then the, four, the thumb is meditating. So when we study the word in all of these ways, um, and then we can then meditate on it, and it's like picking up an object. If you have all four fingers and a thumb, it works a lot better if you have all of these different ways to have to incorporate scripture into your heart, um, you're much better able to grasp it and to make it part of who you are um, as a disciple. It's much better able to inform your formation as a disciple. So highly recommend, if you don't have that as part of your spiritual practice, to consider that. Um, the, the crisis also got me thinking about, of course, believers in places that don't have ready access to all the amazing resources we have here. Uh, we're really blessed. Pretty much anyone in the U.S. who wants to read God's word can, but um, not all believers have that privilege. And I think in those situations, people are doubly glad to have scripture hidden in their heart um, where you can still have access to it regardless of the situation. Another thing that I really appreciated Dr. Roberts bringing up in this lecture was this um, idea he touched on briefly that we tend to sort of discount the role of imagination, um, the role of things that maybe aren't so easily empirically measured in our faith. And some of those have been important to Christians um, for many prior centuries. So I liked the quote from George Boyd, um, or sorry, Greg Boyd. It is then small wonder that the traditional practice of communing with God through imagination has waned in our age. In sharp contrast to Christians in the past, we are inclined to interpret dreams to be nothing more than the voice of our unconscious minds at night, visions as mere hallucinations, and imaginative dialogues and prayer is just psychological forms of self-manipulation. I do think in Western Christianity, we often discount those aspects of faith. And I really appreciated the way that Dr. Roberts very sensitively and carefully um, talked about how those could still be part of our faith, provided they are always submitted to the authority of God's word. They are in line with what he has clearly revealed to us there. And um, I, like that, I like the use of fruit as a benchmark for whether some sort of imagination or practice is in line with God's word, because we know from the Bible that spiritual disciplines that are 
um, that are traditionally part of what a Christian would do, if they are not practiced in a way that's honoring to God, can still can be things we shouldn't do, like um, fasting, for instance. Isaiah 58 talks about inappropriate uses of fasting because people were like fighting with their neighbors. Um, they were just mistreating those who worked for them and such. Whereas if we have a spiritual discipline that seems a little bit different from what we normally do in Western Christianity, but it does result in good fruit, perhaps that's something we should prayerfully consider. So definitely gave me a lot to think about. Um, I wish I'd heard this talk 15 years ago because, you know, sometimes like some of us occasionally will have like a dream or something where God teaches you about something, but in Western Christianity, like you don't necessarily have a framework to interpret that. But now I can look back and see, okay, there was some good fruit that came in my life. Like maybe this one influenced me to read my Bible every day or that one influenced me to like become a Christian. So it's really cool to have that framework for interpreting things in light of God's word. So in sum, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts, and looking forward to discussing this further. I'm tempted to say that, like my colleagues from the sciences, I'm not sure why I'm on this panel, because I spend very little time thinking about the imagination. Uh, <laughs> but that would be false. Um, no, it's, it's often customary, as, as Dr. Mitchell was saying, for a respondent on a panel to find something in the lecture to critique. Um, this is not usually done out of spirit of competition or hostility or any of those things, but as, as Dr. Mitchell again was saying, it's, it's an idea of collegiality to, to sort of hone the conversation and ideally nudge the conversation towards truth. Um, be that tradition it is, as it may, I have a hard time finding anything in Dr. Le Robert's lecture that I really genuinely and honestly take umbrage with. Um, it's quite probable that if I looked hard enough, I could find something. But I think that type of critique seems not in the spirit of inquiry in which a response is supposed to be offered. So in these remarks, I won't really be criticizing any of Dr. Roberts' arguments as such. Critique, however, is not the only available scholarly response. Another response, and one that keeps, I believe, in mind the extent to which the goal of a faith and reason process is to model scholarly conversation is extension is to say to extend the argument, to extend the implications of this lecture in areas not explicitly covered by the lecture. Again, this is not meant to imply that the lecture should have covered these areas, only that it didn't, at least not explicitly. And so I offer some suggestions of things that we, and that's all of us, right, might continue to think about rising out of this lecture. A couple areas I saw that might be further developed or at least thought about further are as follows. Um, one, one is perhaps a more explicit discussion of how the practice of the presence of God might resolve the apparent theological tension that exists in current conversation between Christian hedonism, and, and when I say Christian hedonism, I'm, I'm, I'm explicitly referring to um, the footnote on page two that, that cites John Piper, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I believe that's what Piper himself Right, has identified as Christian hedonism. But, but an apparent, and, and the adjective is important to me at least, an apparent theological tension between Christian hedonism and the call to take up our cross. Um, on my own social media feed in, in recent days and weeks, I've seen uh, some of this tension come up as people attack the idea of Christian hedonism as being sort of inherently unchristian since we're called to suffer. I think, and, and this really actually is, I say the paper might, or, or the implications of the paper might be to discuss this more explicitly. I actually think that, that implicitly Dr. Uh, Roberts' paper resolves this tension quite a bit, right, in, in, in the idea of the uh, practice of the presence of God, because it, it highlights ways, and in particular uh, the in, invocation of Brother Lawrence, right, and, and if any of you have not read Brother Lawrence's book. It's, it's really, it's, it's quick, it's small, right? You can fit it in over Christmas break of nowhere, nowhere else, and it's, it's really good. But Brother Lawrence gets at this issue that, that satisfaction is actually found in suffering, right? That this is part of the practice of presence, that, that satisfaction and suffering are not, right, 
actually in tension if we frame this properly, but, but actually they go together. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm recalling, uh, it's been years since I read this book, but at one point late in life, if I'm remembering correctly, Brother Lawrence developed a pain, right? Um, and so it was very painful to, for, for him to lay on one side, and he actually asked his brother monks to roll him on that side so that he would be in pain because he felt like that the physical pain was, was a way of participating with the suffering of Christ on his behalf. And I, he doesn't say so in so many words, but I suspect that in this actual physical suffering, he found a measure of spiritual satisfaction. So I do think, in any case... Um, I think that some of what Dr. Roberts has implications to say for, for what, it, what is, is only an apparent right, tension between Christian hedonism and taking up our cross. Um, another area might be to elaborate on the difference between faith by sight, or sorry, the difference between faith and sight. Right? Um, by considering the term insight, which is something I wrote in the margin next to that passage in Dr. Um, Robert's lecture, and, and insight, which of course is not necessarily linked to physical sight at all. Um, as some of my students have drawn attention to in recent Western literature discussions, there seems to be a link in Greek myth, right, most clearly embodied in the prophet Tiresias, um, but something also Im implicit in the figures of Oedipus, Homer, Demodocus, between a lack of physical sight and the gift of prophetic insight. In other words, it, well, as, as Steven Tyler once crooned, right? It took a blind man that taught me how to see, right? There, there is that sort of, the, 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 again, it's, it's, it's something that, that goes together that's, that's not a tension. Um, I do find Dr. Roberts' reframing of the tension between faith and reason as instead a tension between faith and sight to be a very useful reframing, but I do wonder if more might be made of it. What are the differences between physical sight and spiritual sight? And what is the relationship between sight and insight? However, the key area of extension I'd like to focus on is the role of the imagination or the role of the mind, and really I think in, in the sense I'm considering here, those two might be synonymous. Um, the mind being the ontological entity, the imagination being the faculty employed by it. Um, if that works, actually, I might ask Dr. Roberts what he thinks about that. I just thought of it. No. Um, <laughs> Feel free to critique. Uh, on page eight, Dr. Roberts argues, uh, the mind's capacity for, inten for intentionality earns it a tremendously privileged ontological status. Of all the things in the world that exist, minds are one of the most powerful and interesting for they can think about nearly anything and everything. But they can also, in some mysterious way, take on the very contours of what they think about. Owen Barfield would actually, I, I, I'm not, this is not to, to argue with, with, with what, the way that Dr. Roberts describes that, but I think it's, it's, I think it's right, but, but Owen Barfield would, would, would emphasize, Owen Barfield, by the way, for those of you who don't know, um, was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis, um, the man who, with whom Lewis engaged throughout the 1920s in the Great War um, that eventually laid the groundwork for Lewis's friendship with Tolkien and his conversion, um, and, and one of the things Barfield taught Lewis that he saw as instrumental was to think in terms of, well, this is the way Barfield put it, interior is anterior and spirit precedes matter, right? That, that spirit comes before matter and, and, and he sort of revised Lewis's thinking. So to come back to this, this, this sentence, um, imaginations can in some mysterious way take on the contours of what they think about. Barfield would also argue that the imagination actually gives things the contours that we think about them in, and I'll, I'll expand more on that in a second. Um, anyway, continuing with the quote, Dr. Roberts says, when they do, correspondence, that is truth, obtains between thought and reality, um, and so forth. So Dr. Roberts gives the mind a privileged ontological status, meaning I presume that it has a sort of privileged state of being. There might be more to it than that, and here's where I expand on Barfield. Um, Barfield described the mind or imagination at least an epistemological, and I think in Barfield's thought, it's an ontological role in creating things. Um, parenthetical aside, I prefer to think of it as an epistemological role because I really like Barfield, and that's significantly less heterodox than ascribing it an ontological role, if that makes any sense. Um, I, I don't know if there's anybody in the room, but some people have listened to me talk about Barfield and then gone on to read Barfield and come back to me and say, Dr. Grell, that's not exactly what he says. Um, I know. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it grants to the imagination at least an epistemological role in creating things. That is to say, he said that the participating imagination, 
is necessary for perceived reality to have any meaningful existence. And if, if, if in the, what I think is his magnum opus, Saving the Appearances, Barfield opens with the description of a rainbow. This, this is an illustration of how the imagination works. Right? And Barfield asks the question, is the rainbow there? Right? Um, and I know that we struggle a little bit with scientific realities, but I think we can at least wrap our heads around this. The rainbow in some sense is not really there, right? It's a play of light on water droplets. You can't in some senses touch it. But Barfield then goes on to ask the question, is a tree really there, right? And he points out that, that particle physics, and I submit to, to my colleagues who know much more about science than, than I do, um, but Barfield's argument that the, the particle physics teaches us that most of the tree is actually space, right, in between the parts of the atom that are bouncing around, and that actually all we're doing in some senses is adding the senses of touch, right? I mean, if you run into a rainbow, it won't knock you down. If you run into a tree, it will. But Barfield says this is simply an accrual of more senses, but that still, right, our collective imagination participating with the divine imagination is necessary for the tree to be there. Um, I would say at least I don't know, that may be a step too far, but it, but it is necessary for our imagination to participate with the divine imagination for the tree to mean anything to us, if you will, right? Um, so as I say, I doubt Dr. Roberts would follow Barfield all the way uh, into involving the participating imagination in the very process of objects coming into being, and I don't know that I would either, but I do think that the idea of imaginatively practicing the presence of God has implications for, which, for the ways in which our imagination participates with the divine imagination to achieve a full and meaningful understanding of reality. Right? Um, the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge is, is pertinent here. Coleridge distinguished in his uh, major work of literary criticism, Biographica Literaria, between what he called the primary and the secondary imagination. The primary imagination ultimately is the imagination of God which creates everything, right? Um, The, po the Sufi poet Rumi says, "Right, uh, close your, close your mouths and close your mouth, something like this, and listen to the maker of mouths, the one who says things." And, and, and in the translation, things is in italics, which I think is a wonderful poetic expression of the fact that God speaks things into existence. We speak and we describe something. God speaks and it has existence, right? Even material existence. Anyway, um, so that's the primary imagination. The, and, and Coleridge says we as, as, as image bearers also participate in the primary imagination. Our imagination is, is the faculty by which we perceive things and perceive things as meaningful. The secondary imagination, Coleridge say, would say, is the imagination by which we then can also create ourselves, right? The, how we could write a poem or a novel or a song or paint a picture. Um, paper mache, what have you, right? Uh, in other words, what I'm getting at in terms of this particular area of extension of the imagination and practicing the presence is that I think the implications for this are not just subjective. And, and, and one of the students in, in my discussion group said, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree, that um, we do owe Dr. Roberts perhaps a, a large uh, debt of thanks for making this one of the most practically applicable faith and reason lectures that we've heard in years, right? Um, <laughs> the question, what it, I don't know, it's probably in the basket somewhere because it always is, right? What do we do with this is kind of an obtuse question to this lecture because I think what we do with this is actually fairly clear um, from what the, the lecture is. But, but in any case, it has, it has incredibly um, subjective applicability in terms of telling us how we ought to think and, and, and or ways that we can think and practice the presence. But I think it also has, and this is one of the areas of extension, potential to be very objectively applicable as well. And what I mean by that is that there are implications for how we, we, I mean, at least epistemological, maybe slightly ontological for how we conceive of reality as a whole um, in the imagination. Though, when I suggest that, I really, I really don't mean that as a separate topic. I, I, I think that that stems directly from um, the, the practice of the presence. And then finally, uh, and this kind of follow, is a following point, um, I think there's a certain sort of apologetic potential in what Dr. Roberts says here, right? Which is that, and I kept noticing this in the quotes from uh, Brother Lawrence and, and um, what's his name? Laubach, was it Frank? Yeah. Yeah, Frank Laubach. Um, sweetness, beauty, delight, right? All of these sorts of things. Um, and uh, I was just reading a book on my own sabbatical by um, theologian, 
guess he's a theologian named Hans Biersma, uh, Heavenly Participation. And one of the things Biersma notes in this work is that as we transition from the 20th to the 21st century, propositional apologetics, and this is speaking particularly to, to you all's generation, propositional apologetics are, are found to be less effective, right? And in some senses, this leaves the church possibly in an, at a loss. But, but, but one of the things Beersman points to is that this opens a tremendous amount of space for imaginative apologetics, right? In, and I think that Dr. Roberts' essay points us in this direction, that this is not necessarily simply a logic problem, um, but the practice of the presence is something experiential. Um, ultimately, I think it, 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 it arrives at the statement that, that Fyodor Dostoevsky said, you know, so many years ago, beauty will save the world, right? There's something very beautiful uh, in the practice of the presence of God um, that I think has tremendous uh, apologetic worth as well. Um, one last thing, and this came up listening to Dr. McGrath's comments, um, and so I'll, I'll ask what's maybe a stupid question, possibly for her to pick up at another point, but I'm interested, is it, is it, is infinity a necessarily imagined concept? Um, or at least what is the role of the imagination in being able to conceive of infinity? But again, I'd pocket that, think about it someday. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Dr. Roberts. And now Dr. Roberts will respond to whatever he wants to. You can ignore it all if you want. You can respond to whatever you want. I've, I've got stars here, so I'll try to be, be brief so we can leave as much time for you all. Thank you, Dr. McGrath. I, I, when I wrote that, if any of these are real large number, I'm thinking, that's probably wrong. And thank you. for. <laughs> there's a whole lot more to infinity than I realized for sure. But we both have a love for infinity and the love of, of mathematics She's much you know, more acquainted with it than I am, but the way in which God has revealed himself in, in that way. Uh, so thank you for that. I also appreci really appreciate your candor, um, just talking about um, how you know, riding a horse in the dark really taught you. It was, it was as though it seemed like God's training wheels for you to, to teach you to trust in him when you're not on the back of a horse in the dark. So that's, I really appreciate that. I mean, it takes, it takes courage to be that transparent, right? Because you you're make yourself vulnerable, but um, but that's really, when, when, when we're able to access somebody at that level, I think it's pr tremendously edifying. So thank you for that. Um, so moving on to um, Dr. Estep, um, talking about the importance of scripture memory. Um, Willard, as you know, many of you know, is, is probably my greatest inspiration as a, as a philosopher. And, he was asked, one time, actually this is in the footnotes, I don't expect that you read the footnotes, but you might, some of them. Uh, uh, he was asked, what's the, what's the most important spiritual discipline if you could only practice one? And he was, of course, uh, an expert on spiritual disciplines, and he said scripture memory, which is surprising. You might think, you know, Bible study or prayer, or, uh, but there's something about scripture memory that truly does lock into your mind uh, the word of God uh, and... Uh, and God prefers to speak in his language. You might think of, of the Bible as God's preferred or mother tongue, if you will. And so uh, when it's in you, the Holy Spirit prefers to use that language first, I would say. Right? So the more, the more of God's language, the more uh, fluent you are in the language of God, the easier it is for him to speak to you. Um, so I do commend it, obviously, None of us probably will memorize the entire uh, Bible in our lifetime, and you do have to prioritize. I do not recommend starting with numbers, but you know, if you have that kind of memory, great, go for it. Um, I, I do recommend uh, memorizing short passages, but maybe even whole chapters, or if, uh, if you feel God calling you to it, a whole book. Um, it has paid remarkable dividends in my own life, and so I, I strongly commend it uh, to you. Uh, so, um, on to uh, Dr. Gruel's uh, remarks, um, talking about the role of suffering. This is a real problem, and actually another friend of mine who read the paper over the weekend said, how do you, you, know, how do you practice the presence in the midst of tremendous grief and loss? I mean, how do you, how do you imagine Christ with you or in you um, when you've just lost uh, your, your wife of 30 years to cancer, or you've just lost a child to a tragic accident? Right? 
Um, and this in part is what the body of Christ is for because there are times when we are not strong enough to do that. We need somebody else to, to bring the, the presence of Christ to us in a sense. They're stronger and able to do that. Although that said, I think as you habituate your mind, uh, you are able actually to, whether it's using your imagination or just to have the awareness, the uh, sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine, which may not come with any images per se, um, but an awareness that God is with you uh, is possible. It is possible. And of course, many people who have experienced suffering uh, will testify to that. Uh, Paul himself, and, and so this is also to the point of the, the tension between Christian hedonism and the, the call to suffer, right? The Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, if somehow to become like him, right? There's a fellowship with Christ in his sufferings that is part of our call. We are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus, right? And so how do you conceive of that as uh, full of joy and uh, you know, ecstasy, as Laubach and Lawrence discuss. Well, but this is part of, of the joy of Christ is, is the defeat of darkness in his suffering, right? Because his suffering was not an end to itself. It was a means to the end of, of victory over death, hell, uh, the evil one, and so forth. And so as we uh, share in the sufferings of Christ, we are, in fact, sharing in his victory uh, and so we can actually count that as joy, right? I think of, of Paul and Silas when they're thrown in jail in the book of Acts, right? They're rejoicing. They're in jail. They're in prison. But they're rejoicing because they've been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ, right? And so there is this ironic, um, paradoxical uh, joy even in our sufferings. Um, and then finally, uh, on his third and fourth point uh, on the ontologically uh, privileged status of the mind. That is, uh, well, Aristotle thought, of course, that, uh, that the prime mover himself was a pure mind thinking only about his own thinking. So Aristotle oriented all of reality around thought. That was the place to begin. Uh, and I might not quite go that far, but of course, God is, is the foundation of everything that exists. Uh, and he has made us in our image. How has he made us in our image? Well, clearly the, the ability to think is unique to us among all that he has created. And so the mind is ontologically privileged. It is special of all the things that exist because God is, among other things, a rational being. And so this idea though that uh, um, our imagination gives, gives reality or gives meaning uh, to say a rainbow. I think there is something to that insofar as God communicates. We know, the scriptures tell us, right, that God communicates through creation specifically. So I'll tell you a very short story. I was an early Christian, um, very young in my faith, uh, was just getting to know God, was reading my Bible on, uh, on a bed in an air-conditioned uh, place in northwest Nebraska, Fort Robinson, Nebraska's old Civil War fort. Um, it's a relatively inexpensive place to go uh, to, for a vacation. So it was hot. It was like July, humid. So I asked God as I was reading my Bible, God, it'd be just really great if, if it would rain. It was a passing thought, a passing prayer. I didn't think much about it. Um, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, in rolls the thunderhead, pours rain, cools, cools it down by maybe 10 degrees for an hour. Right, uh, but but what did I what did I take from that? How did I interpret that? It, it seemed like the best explanation was clear that, that God was was answering my prayer. He was speaking to me, and to top it off, there was a rainbow across the sky. All right, so so the way that I read that, the way my imagination or my thought process read that was only that God was speaking to me. Now you could argue that away. Of course you could but I think that's the best explanation. Actually, I was so young in my faith, I didn't actually know the meaning of the rainbow in Genesis, that God would covenant never to flood the earth again. It was only maybe a year later that I, I discovered that, and I thought, oh, so God really was speaking to me because there's actually that symbolism in scripture itself. So I do think there's something to that.
as those of you who have done this before know that we generally have students come up and read their uh, questions so there's more direct interaction. Um, in light of our COVID world, um, you're going to stay seated and I will read the questions. And this is a, just a concession to, to the reality in which we find ourselves. So um, that's why we're doing it a little bit differently. Uh, and there are a variety of questions here and some of them uh, are, are similar to each other. And I just want to start with, there, there's a good number of questions about the imagination. And, and it seems like that's where uh, a, a lot of people are pushing. And, and there's certainly a lot of things that we can uh, discuss there. But here's just a, a, a quick two, two questions that are similar um, that have to do with this, this um, practicing the presence, as you've put it. And, and I'll read them both because they're both brief, but they get at the same thing. If practicing the presence of God is optional, uh, can we still pursue Christ's likeness without practicing it? And, and related, can we do the with God life without the use of the imagination? Uh, it, I'll leave it at that, I think. You can take those where you want. Yeah, yeah, it's good. You know, um, spiritual disciplines uh, are instrumental goods. That is, they're good if they work, if they help you to draw near to God. Um, that said, there are many spiritual disciplines that are also commanded by God to do. <laughs> so they're not merely instrumental, uh, they're also acts of obedience. So not all of them are explicitly commanded, though, in Scripture. So practicing the presence is not explicitly commanded, at least the way that practice has developed over the centuries. Whereas, say, praying <laughs> is commanded. Uh, you know, reading, uh, meditating on scripture, it's a commandment of the scriptures, right? So you have to first kind of decide uh, how are you conceiving of this thing? Um, imaginations vary from person to person and some have greater, more active imaginations than others. I think there's a lot of ways to pursue God without ever really even scratching your imagination or ever deploying it. Um, I did that for a very long time and very profitably, right? Um, and of course, there are objections that I've dealt with briefly in the paper. And if you, if you found it objectionable, I'd say, well, there's still plenty of ways to pursue God, to walk intimately with him. Uh, and uh, even if you never engaged in that practice. So I don't think it's a, a necessary condition. Uh, for uh, cultivating the with God life. I just have found, certainly in my own life, that it's been fruitful, and I, I have argued that it's fruitful in other people's lives, so it's, it's worth at least trying. Um, I'm a sort of a, an experimentalist about these sorts of things. I, you know, I try a practice and I see what sort of result it has, and if I don't find it all that useful, uh, I put it back on the shelf. Doesn't mean that I'll never try it again, but it means that I try something else. Right? It's all for the sake of uh, drawing near to God, of knowing him and walking in obedience to him. So uh, that's, that's how I'd begin to answer that question. Yeah. In uh, sort of in related, if, if imagination is a faculty of mind. Yes. And, uh, and it's a subset of reason. You, Correct. You've, you've yep. called it that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a faculty, um, I presume that one can exercise it or cultivate it or allow it to atrophy. Yeah. How then um, would a person actively cultivate the faculty of imagination? That would be the sort of the general uh, direction, but then also actively cultivate it in a way that it is most uh, profitable for, for uh, becoming more like Christ. And I guess follow up, does Christ, how did he use his imagination? What was the, what was, right. if we're supposed to be like Christ, yeah. what was, I mean, that's, there's, that's almost an impossible question in a way, what's going on inside yeah. of his mind, but, right. but what would, in, in terms of, of this discussion, be a Christ-like imagination? Yeah. How would we even yep. approximate or, or imagine such a thing? Yeah, I mean, here's another sort of further to push that objection a little bit more. It's like, well, did Jesus practice the presence of Jesus? <laughs> that sounds a little odd. 
right? Well, no, because he was Jesus, so he didn't have to practice his own presence. Um, yeah, so how do, we, how do we cultivate the imagination? Um, there are certainly exercises that we encourage you in the liberal arts to participate in, namely uh, reading literature, uh, that strongly encourage you to cultivate, to use. You have to use your imagination when you read uh, fiction. I would say, too, uh, to just read the scriptures with an, with an eye towards the imagery that they give you. Uh, I've been doing this recently, just a... I, I will sit in a book of the Bible for as long as I feel like it's profitable, so it could be weeks or months sometimes, and I just reread it over and over and over again and maybe memorize parts of it. And So I just finished James recently, and it, it has been interesting to see just how much imagery is actually in that epistle. Right? So whenever there's a word picture or a metaphor uh, used, explore it, right? Um, take time. Don't, don't get in a hurry. Uh, let your imagination fill in the gaps, right? So, um, you know, James uh, talks about, um, you know, water from, or, you know, water from a, a saltwater uh, well, uh, right? Use, use those pictures and, and fill them in. Take your time. Um, ask God to ins- inspire you, to breathe into you, right? Um, you know, when well, you talk about Barfield, Dr. Gruel, about, uh, he, he's, he's, I want to talk about uh, being sub-creators. Is that him? I, that's, I think that's Tolkien's term. Actually, Tolkien. Barfield uses the term. He's a little bit more auspicious. Barfield uses the term co-creator. Co-creator, okay. Which is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the Platonist in me would push back on that a little bit insofar as uh, God is the originator of all ideas. He is the master creator. There's nothing that he hasn't thought of. No possibility, no, um, no imagined reality that has not crossed his mind from all of eternity. However, there's plenty of uh, possible worlds, alternative realities that have not crossed any human mind. But when they do, uh, the way I view it is that God is delighting to reveal a bit of his imagination to his creation. So we're not co-creating exactly, um, or even sub-creating, we're discovering. God is uh, revealing his mind to us. He does that in imagination, he does that in mathematics, he does that in all of the different uh, ways of pursuit. Um, so, you know, cultivating imagination, just taking your time, don't get in a hurry, um, and ask God to expand it. I mean, I, I'm a trained analytic philosopher. We're, we're known for not using our imagination. It's almost like, newsflash, philosopher discovers he has a right brain. That's sort of <laughs> the way this project has gone. Um, we're so steeped in analysis and breaking down concepts and breaking them down and down and down and down to the very fundamentals, right? But there's a whole realm of, of imagery and imagination that we're not really encouraged as philosophers to engage in, uh, and, but it's profitable, uh, and the scriptures do it. And of course, Jesus does it uh, masterfully in his parables. So use scripture, use literature, uh, and, and use community. Um, create together, write stories together, just imagine. Uh, I, like to, I like to think a lot about heaven and just wondering what it might be like. Why? Because it motivates me. Uh, it makes me look forward to it. Uh, I know it's coming. I don't know when, um, but I know it's going to be good. And so I try to imagine the greatest possible outcomes imaginable. I mean, you know, the universe has a remarkable number of galaxies in it, somewhere between 300 billion and 10 trillion. We really don't know, right? But sometimes I'll imagine things like, well, what if God, in his grace, in his mercy, entrusted a galaxy to each one of his children? A whole galaxy. (laughs) Well, that's a pretty big responsibility. I would need a lot of help to do that. God, of course, is competent to do that. But, you know, just sort of um, spinning your imagination, wondering uh, what would God allow us to do? Uh, We have lots of time to do it. Um, or what would the jokes be like in heaven? The, the funniest you've ever heard. And they might last a couple of days. I mean, you have all the time. You don't, I, do, I do think of heaven in a very sort of uh, lived temporal way. Um, but use your imagination, right? And then maybe ask God to say, well, could you give me just a little taste of a little bit of a joke, you know? And that would, you know, delight other people. So just ask, ask God to inspire you and see what happens.
I might add, anyone on the panel, feel free to jump in. And if you have one of these heavenly jokes, I don't now's have a perfect time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say, though, it, it, um, and this goes back to some what spurred that question, I mean, the, the relationship between the imagination and reason. And, and Lewis, I think, is, has a really, well, for me at least, a really useful and elucidating thought on this. In a very inauspiciously titled essay, Blue Spells and Flowlin Spheres, A Semantic Nightmare. Um, but he says, he essentially says, I mean, it gets it, imagination is sort of the raw material for reason, right? He, at one point he says, I'm not speaking here of reason, but, uh, but imagination, which is the antecedent condition for reason, right? That, that, that imagination sort of provides us with this primordial raw mental raw material that reason then crafts into truth. And so he says, imagination is to reason as meaning is to truth, um, which I find useful. I just wanted to add too that I, I think that as we look out into the universe and there's been a lot in the news about new discoveries um, that we're seeing God's imagination, that he slowly reveals more um, about his creation. Um, he inspires humans to come up with new instruments and ways of measuring um, and, and making these observations that again allow us an opportunity to see his creativity and, and to get a glimpse um, of what he has imagined. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded, you know, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And then we go to the task of saying how. How do they declare the glory of God? And we want to know. And God says, here, let me show you. Uh, and we're in awe. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting to note that we here on planet Earth have been situated just such that we can see more of the Milky Way than we would have had we been situated in almost any other place in the galaxy. It looks like we were meant to discover what God has created, which is exactly what the scriptures say. Dr. McGrath, that, that your, your comment has made me wonder what Dr. Roberts would say. Would you say God has an imagination? Are you asking me? Yeah, because Dr. McGrath said that, and I just, I, I've never thought of it like that. I'm wondering, is, is, yeah. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> Put that in the herald. <laughs> um, could, could you perhaps, given that we're all sitting on the edge of our seats, um, explain what you mean by that? Well, I don't think that we should think of God as coming up with a new idea at some point in time. He is an eternal being, so he has existed from all eternity. That means that he's never learned anything in terms of uh, his uh, thinking about all the ways that the universe could go. But he is aware of all the ways they could go. And so in that sense, his awareness of possibility uh, is maximal. Uh, and in that sense, it's an imagination. And I actually want to correct my own sort of criticism of analytic philosophy because we do actually have to use our imagination to test all sorts of claims because we're looking to ask, is it possible that something, right? Is it possible for, Alvin Plan, a famous Christian philosopher, says, would it be possible for Socrates to have been an alligator? <laughs> well, <laughs> who asked these questions? <laughs> People who believe in essence, Aristotelian essence, that's who asked them. Uh, and the question is, how much can Socrates change before he's no longer Socrates? Well, that takes some imagination. So there is a sense, actually, in which philosophers do use their imagination. We just don't think of it in terms of the artistic, creative side of things where you're creating paintings or wonderful uh, stories and so forth. It is, of course, the analytic tradition of philosophy that is most guilty of sort of ignoring the imagination. Yeah, yes. Socrates has never um, yes. right. been accused of yeah. not uh, yeah. having, uh, although he did have a kind of war with the artist. But, yeah. but God, I mean, when we, when we think of imagination, maybe it's just me, but I'm, I'm guessing some of you agree, that, that we think of it in terms of, or one feature of imagination is discovery. It's like, aha, I've never thought of that before, and your imagination runs with you, or however we put it, um, that, that it's, something, it's thinking something that we haven't thought before. If that's how we're thinking of imagination, yeah. no, God doesn't have that, so at best we've got a kind of yeah. 
analog. It's, it's, it's an analogical relationship at best. It's yep. certainly not. Yeah, so, agreed, agreed. And that's the way so many things are in our Imago days that we are like God, but we aren't identical uh, to God in terms of our faculties or capacities, right? Um, but the fact that he's aware of all possibilities is something like what happens when we imagine because we're imagining the world uh, being a different way than it is. And uh, so we're accessing that part of God's knowledge. Yeah, that's a way things could be, or at least it's a way things seem like they could be. Right? There's an interesting, actually, debate, right? Uh, especially with respect to this area of philosophy known as modality. Um, you know, you remember Leibniz, if you've had philosophy, Godfrey Leibniz thought that this, this world was the best of all possible worlds. It was such because God, of course, does what's best. He would never do anything less than the best. Uh, Voltaire mocks him uh, through Candide. Dr. Pangloss, this is ridiculous. This isn't the best of all possible worlds. There's all sorts of improvements I would make. So um, there's that sort of metaphysical puzzle, right? In other words, maybe there are no other possibilities. And yet we, cer we certainly think, well, it could have been different. It will be different. How will it be different? And um, so there's an interesting sub-debate there. We won't go into that. But. Here's another question. Considering that our human minds are incapable of creating a mental image of Christ that fully comprehends his person, does this practice risk harmfully confining our conception of him and therefore creating an idol? Yeah, it's a legitimate concern, right? Actually, really, if you think of it this way, even if you were, if you happen to be alive in the incarnation and you fully believed Jesus when he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you might say, okay, I've got the Father entirely figured out. I've seen, you said it, Jesus. I don't think that's what he was saying. He wasn't saying, you know everything there is to know about the Father, but if you want to know the most about the Father, you stare at me, Jesus says. Right, so when we uh, use our imagination informed, deeply informed, I would say, by the Gospels in all of Scripture, right, then we are uh, reflecting on God's greatest revelation of himself in history. There is no greater, clearer, more perspicuous, more detailed revelation of God than in Jesus Christ. So that's what we're using our imagination to do, uh, is to, A, be informed about who Christ is, Right? And then uh, reminding ourselves, remembering who Jesus is in the particularities of our life. Right? But of course, uh, the Lagos, the second person of the Trinity, the necessarily existing eternal God, the one through whom all things were created, uh, is not captured in an embodied form. <laughs> not entirely, not even really close, closely. It's a mystery, of course, the incarnation. Um, so yes, absolutely, we need to be careful. And I think we need to remind ourselves regularly in this practice that the Lagos uh, had no body uh, before creation, right? But eternally existed in the tripersonal Godhead, who is God. Right? Jesus was not created, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. Right? That's, that's the Lagos. Don't you think, though, there's an analog in that I mean, it's commonplace to say the more I know, the more that I know that I don't know. Right. Uh, don't you think there's an imaginative analog that the more you're trying to practice the presence of God by imagining Christ, the more you're really consciously aware how much your imagination fails? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Because at the more you focus on the incarnation, the more you realize how, how beyond your grasp God is. And yet you're pressing in, trying to, to know this God as best you can through his greatest revelation, who is Christ. In that sense, maybe you could argue that if you don't practice the presence of God, your idea of Christ might be more confined than if you do. Uh, we have to stay humble. We have to stay uh, in a, an attitude of um, correction. Correct me, God. Lead me into all truth. Uh, save me from error. Lead me not into temptation. Uh, you know, when Jesus was asked, how should we pray? He gave us the Lord's Prayer. It was intended to be said regularly. Um, daily doesn't hurt. More than once doesn't hurt. Don't say it by rote uh, without any thought. Uh, I recommend I do this. I use the Lord's Prayer as an outline 
primary themes I should focus on in prayer. I might spend a, a decent chunk of time just on our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You can spend a long time just on that. You don't have to finish the prayer necessarily, uh, but use it as an outline. It is the Lord's prayer after all. What's the difference between imagination in practicing the presence of God and the imagination of an artist that invokes to create? Maybe I should. Same faculty, the same faculty, or is it uh, similar by analogy? What's, what's the relationship? Yeah, um, I, if anybody else wants to chime in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not just trying to you know, tap out or anything. But. Um, <laughs> I, I would be tempted to refer to Coleridge's distinction between the primary and the secondary there. Um, meaning that I think, and I, I mean this is a knee jerk so it's probably wrong, but um, it, it, I would be tempted to say that, that, that <clears throat> practicing the presence of God is primarily a perceptive faculty of the imagination. In other words, it's, it's, it's it, or, or receptive, right? I mean, we're, we're on the receiving end of this. We're not, we're not giving this. And, and, and that would correspond, I think, to what Coleridge says in terms of the primary imagination, the imagination that perceives what God has created. However, I think, at least this is the way I read Coleridge talking about that, that and the reason that it's called the secondary imagination, the creative faculty, is that it's derivative of the primary. And, and this is true. This is true of people who write fiction well. People who are not, well, let me give the obverse. People who don't perceive well don't write good fiction. They write bad fiction, right? Because, or, or whatever the creative output is. I mean, it, it's, it's predicated on an abundance of that first kind of imagination. So, I mean, I th in some sense, you know, I mean, I, I think they're different faculties, but if the question is what's the difference between the imagination practicing the presence of God and the imagination creating something, well, I think you could distinguish between the faculties, but if you take something like, you know, George Frederick Handel in the, in the process of creating the Messiah, they're somewhat inseparable, right? I mean, one gives birth to the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we should neglect at least the point I made, which is that there are really two faculties of the mind operative in practicing the presence. I was emphasizing imagination in part because yeah. that's the one that I've been weakest in, but Propositionally, we can practice the presence of God, and we should all the time. We talk to God. We, we declare his glory, right? We remind ourselves of his promises, right? Um, this is the ordinary way that we would commune with God and thereby practice his presence, right? If we remind ourselves that, uh, you know, Jesus, the Great Commission, right? Uh, Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. You recite that, and it's, it's a promise of God. It's true, God is with you, whether you're imagining it or not, you're propositionally declaring it. And by, just by doing that, you're brought near to God. So you don't have to use your imagination actually to practice the presence. However, that is a way that I've argued that you can and probably should. Right, so what's the difference when you use your imagination to create art versus imagination to think of Christ? Well, it's relational, I would say. All right, I, can, I can develop, uh, paint a beautiful sunset or cast a beautiful bronze sculpture and have no thought of God at all in the process. I could also do it unto the glory of God, right? But practicing the presence is, is essentially relationship, relational. You are practicing the presence of God. You are drawn near to God. The ma imagination is a means to that end. It is not an end in itself. Whereas it certainly can be in many forms of art. Now, for, for a disciple, for an apprentice of Jesus, it shouldn't be, right? Uh, you're, you're painting, you're painting, you're, uh, you know, whatever art form you're engaged in, you're doing it uh, with Christ. Uh, you practice the presence while you do that, while that's your work, you're doing it. Uh, and you're asking him, Ask him about the details. See what he wouldn't reveal. Uh, there's an article that you read in Logic. It's the first article. It's called Jesus the Logician. In that piece, Dallas Willard uh, uses as an example uh, Catherine Marshall, who was wife of Peter Marshall, who was the chaplain for the US Senate uh, in the 50s or 60s. And she had a uh, interior decorating problem, you'll recall. She didn't quite know uh, which color or which shape of drapery to use. Very simple, mundane sort of thing. 
Um, but she went and she asked the Lord, uh, what should I do? <laughs> Uh, and she came back half an hour, and she had, she had her answer, uh, and it worked just perfectly. Right? I do believe that God delights to participate us, with us at that level. He wants us to invite him into all of our life. There's nothing, there's nothing too insignificant if it matters to you, and you have some puzzle about how to do it, or you want to do it better. Ask the Lord. <laughs> He's happy to, to help. He's very generous, and he has lots of means. He's extremely wealthy. This seems like a, a, a justification for fervent prayer prior to exams. Indeed, and during and after. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, that there are some um, Christians who are who, who would who would look askance at your argument. Finding imagination to be um, deeply suspect, and and I wonder if you could speak to to that. And it seems to me that part of that uh, suspicion may be rooted in a in a misunderstanding of of these categories of reason and imagination. And and you you made a gesture at at, at uh, sort of categorizing. Uh, those in a way that may be uh, um, a bit surprising, but but I think it, it it may be worthwhile to to work through that a little bit because I think we've come to see reason as as the uh, and maybe even all the way back to to or reading a particular version of reason or vision of reason back into you know Aristotle man is a rational animal right and that's the source of reason and uh, and 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 imagination is merely a kind of fancy it's 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 what children do right and when you when you grow up you put that sort of thing behind you and you become a rational adult and so so this would in a sense suggest that that imagination is is the province of of immaturity and 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 so your the whole tenor of your argument seems to 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 run at odds with that account of of the human faculties, and so I think what you're trying to do is is reconstitute that that uh, vision of human faculties, so that we can uh, embrace the imagination as a truly adult faculty. Uh, but maybe if you could just sketch that out very clearly yeah. um, for so that so because I mean what what Dr. Gurel said was interesting in terms of apologetics. It's been suggested that here, uh, maybe somewhere around the, the turn of the century that, that, that propositional apologetics is becoming increasingly less effective. That's an interesting claim in itself. And, and, and what you said following up is that, that the alternative is imaginative apologetics. Okay, what is imaginative apologetics, right? Is that like with little hand puppets and, you know, and, and so on? And you think, well, that's silly. We need to be hard-headed Christians and not not doing that. But it, straight, it, it just it, it reminded me of a statement from um, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, who became uh, Pope Benedict. He said that the, the greatest things that the church gives to the world, the most compelling aspects, uh, apologetic aspects, were the lives of the saints, that is, the lives of believers, the, the beauty of the lives, and then also the, the art of the church. And if there's any uh, sense of truth to that claim, it seems that both of those are a kind of um, artistic representation, representation of the beauty of Christ and his creation. And this is what is going to draw us. Yeah, yep. There's a lot to say there. Um, is, you know, the first question, is imagination just a sign of immaturity? Are you encouraging us to... Um, become children, you know, the Apostle Paul. When I was a child, I, you know, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, and I became a man, I put away childish things. So children pretend they have friends, they pretend all the time. I, I was just picking up dress-up clothes off the floor of my garage last night <laughs> because my children put them on all the time. Uh, and imagine, and that's a really important uh, faculty that God gives children uh, to... Um, practice to get ready for adulthood. What would it be like to be this? To be a police officer, to be a princess, right? They are role-playing, uh, and, and that's an important part of 
um, maturity. Uh, and there is a sense in which now that you're uh, you know, in college, you're being asked to think at a level of abstraction that you haven't been asked to think at uh, prior to now. It is part of your intellectual development to think abstractly, even at the highest levels of abstraction, uh, philosophy and mathematics and, and literature. It's a high level of abstraction and it's not for the immature. Right? So is there still a sense though in which the imagination is useful, profitable and not silly? or just a game? And I think the answer is found in the incarnation because God, uh, a very uh, transcendent, as transcendent as could be, being beyond our comprehension, uh, reveals himself in the body of Jesus of Nazareth, a human born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. Uh, he puts flesh on himself. Uh, and reveals himself in particularities of human life, right? He gives us a picture of himself, literally a picture of himself. And so um, with the incarnation in a sense, and this is one of the quotations from Leanne Payne, um, everything changes insofar as God's attitude, even to matter itself. He's deemed it uh, uh, worthy enough to uh, take on the very... Uh, person, the second person of the Godhead, God has seen fit to clothe himself in human flesh. Right? And so uh, there's a concretization, there's a particularization of God in Jesus. Right? And the imagination, of course, allows us both to think about other possibilities, but also to put flesh on it, right? to imagine the, the details. Right? Uh, you know, these, the greatest stories have very developed characters, right? The Lord of the Rings. Um, there's, there's developed detailed languages and characters and regions and maps. There's a lot of detail there, right? And so that's one of the, the values of the imagination is that it allows you to really uh, become very familiar uh, with something that's abstract, right? And so God has done that in Christ. The imagination helps us to continue what God was doing in the incarnation by, by letting those pictures in the gospels actually inform our lives now in the 21st century, some 2,000 years later. Um, Jesus is alive, he's risen, uh, and he lives by his spirit in his people. Uh, and we want, to, we want to see how that actually plays out um, in our lives today. I guess I want to add that Again, I'm, I'm the physical world person, but um, I, I think one of the, the, the important things about imagination is that without it, we would become stuck in some ways, that we, we can feel that we're at an end of a path and you can throw your hands up mm -hmm. um, and that there's no, no solution. Or, um, and I, I think God gave us an imagination to be able to work with him and to move forward. So I'm gonna give a physics example, of course, but um, God uh, has blessed us with a discovery of um, a set of equations that were not empirically derived, but they're um, derived out of the language of mathematics, which I view as a, a language that he has also gifted us. And in that language um, of the description, these are functions that aren't, they, they have discontinuities in them, meaning that there are points um, where, where it, uh, it's not described. We don't know what goes on at that point. And so with our imagination, we can try and fill in that point, and I think God can, will inspire us with that, and it gives us a whole new line to start discovering again, to to try and understand, to come closer to God and what his physical creation is. So, and without that imagination, we would otherwise just throw our hands up and say, well, I, I can't learn any more about his physical creation. But I think he challenges us through the use of imagination um, to keep that quest of discovering um, more about him. Uh, more, uh, he allows us to experience more to be of his, he reveals himself more to us through these discoveries yeah you know there's a, there's a close relationship between creation and imagination 
right? We think of creative people as having a, a significant imagination. I'm thinking actually though of uh, Kekul, the discoverer of the benzene molecule, the shape of the benzene mo molecule. He was uh, beating his head against the wall, trying to figure out what is the actual geometry of benzene. And uh, he has a dream, <laughs> so the story goes anyway, uh, in which he sees uh, six snakes chasing each other, uh, head to tail, uh, in a hexagonal shake, shape. And he wakes from his dream, uh, and he says, it's a hexagon. God had revealed to him, this is the story, um, the shape of the benzene molecule. And so when I think of imagination, I, I do think of it as a way, and of course he was dreaming, so he didn't intentionally do that, but um, that is a way for God to reveal himself but I always want to ground that in the scriptures, right? I don't want to say that he's adding to the scriptures, but he could be illustrating it. So let me give an example from this morning, actually. Uh, in our, our main floor restroom, we have a picture uh, of Rembrandt's The Prodigal Son, right? It's a beautiful parable. It's one of my favorite parables in all of the gospels. It communicates a great deal of, of who God is, who God the Father is, and his longing to have mercy on those who would come in repentance. Right, and so that's a, it's a beautiful painting. If you know anything about Rembrandt, you know that he was sort of salt of the earth sort of painter. He, he, wanted, he painted realistic peasant uh, folk uh, in you know, depicting even the Gospels. And so it's a beautiful picture of, of the father embracing his son. The son is uh, knelt before him in humility. Right? And I thought, well, this is sort of funny. Uh, I'm speaking to God this morning. Here I am about to go speak about uh, the imagination and all of this, and I think God's actually at least reminding me of, because I actually referenced that parable <laughs> in the in the talk, and it was though, uh, was God speaking to me? Well, I can't be sure, but I, I give him the benefit of the doubt, which is what we do a lot uh, with faith. There are several questions here that are dealing with um, the same theme. I'll read a couple. What's the role of the church in framing an accurate image of God? And what does the Christian church and community, what role does the Christian church and community play in shaping, developing, and anchoring the imagination? And finally, how can the church guard against heresy when considering the mysteries of God, those things God has intended to remain mysterious? via the imagination. So these are all uh, sort of coalescing around a question of the role of the church in cultivating the imagination and guarding against what we might call a heretical use of the imagination. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a dynamic relationship, I would say, between the church and the word of God, right? As the church gathered, uh, reads the scriptures and debates over its meaning, its proper interpretation. Uh, you know, Christians obviously have a different, uh, differences of opinion about the role the church plays uh, in interpreting uh, scripture, the role of uh, creeds and councils and that sort of thing, right, to define orthodox interpretations of scriptures. So there's a lot there that we probably don't want to get into, right? Um, I do, I did actually want to mention, though, your other point in the previous remarks about uh, the role of, of beauty uh, in the church's role in uh, making the, the gospel beautiful by, well, at least historically being really the center of cultural activity in the arts. We've lost that, right? Uh, but there's something, uh, there's a real loss in the, the loss of, of church architecture, I would say. I mean, there, there are excesses and abuses, but, but there's great beauty there too. Uh, and the greatest beauty should be found uh, in the church, in the body of Christ. Uh, also, one, before I forget, there's a book that's recently been written by a philosopher named Paul Gould, who's now at um, Palm Beach Atlantic University, entitled Cultural Apologetics, in which he argues exactly what Dr. Mitchell was getting at, that um, Christianity without the beauty of Christianity uh, is not successful apologetically. We must work hard to make Christianity something that is desirable and beautiful, uh, something that uh, people would want to be true, 
right? And if we, if we de-emphasize the imagination, if we de-emphasize the arts, we lose a tremendously powerful apologetic tool, uh, even weapon, uh, to make Christianity attractive. It's all actually in response to a remark by, I want to say is Richard Taylor, but I'm not sure if that's the right philosopher, who, who very candidly says in the opening of one of his books that he doesn't want there to be a God. He doesn't want theism, which is just a more generic term for you know, Christianity. He doesn't want it to be true. And that's, that's something we don't want to hear said. We want, we want Christianity. Granted, I mean, it's going, not going to be attractive to somebody who's not willing to repent. Right? But if somebody's willing to recognize that there may be a needed correction in his life, uh, we want a picture of Christianity, the picture ultimately of God, the triune God to be as beautiful as it is. Uh, we want people to be ravished with the glory of God, is the way Dallas Willard puts it. You can't make God ravishing if you're not ravished yourself by God. Right? And so one of the ways you do that uh, is to use your imagination, to, to let God fill it in for you, to show you just how glorious and beautiful he is. Um, pray this prayer, try this, try this for 30 days, I challenge you. Ask God to show you his glory and see what happens. And then write down, see what happens. And then I'd be interested to know, come tell me. You see, do, you, do you think that you see God's glory more now than you did 30 days ago? I'd just be interested. You might not, but I wouldn't be surprised if you do. Yeah, I was follow up on that when one thing that I, I, this idea of beauty as well and, and, and dovetail that with, you know, it's sort of this idea of mystery. I mean, um, I think just from a psychological pragmatic viewpoint or pragmatic psychological viewpoint, I guess I would say the, the I mean, the, the reason is by nature a critical faculty. And I mean, there, um, you know, one, one of the reasons Beersma says that, that, that propositional apologetics aren't working as much anymore is because, you know, postmodernism has reduced truth to narrative and so forth. And so there's these, there's built-in mechanisms for not responding to the proposition. But there's also a sense in which the reason is by nature a critical faculty. The proposition speaks to the reason. A reason that is not predisposed to accept it will meet it on its own terms and comes up with, with objections, right? The imagination is a more receptive and synthetic faculty, and I think to the extent that you create something that is true but also beautiful, right? I mean, just strictly from a from a practical psychological viewpoint, it seems to me like it would have more effectiveness in our day and age, right? Because it, because it bypasses these critical faculties of the reason and speaks to the imagination, um, and you know, in a discipleship way, in the relationship, you can work on on reason later. But but the other thing is, right? Um, it was mentioned, you know, preserving this idea of mystery. I, th I think the imagination is entirely at home in mystery. I mean, in some senses, the imagination is a very audacious faculty, but in some sense, it's a very humble faculty, right? The imagination never demands to have everything figured out, right? It just inhabits a space. Um, and so I think in that sense that the, the imagination, you know, I mean, it, it, particularly in the sense in which Dr. Roberts is talking about practicing the presence, is entirely at home in mystery, I, I would say, right? Yep. Well, in our closing minutes, I thought we'd just give Dr. Roberts the last word. He can sum things up. He can exhort you. He can tell a heavenly joke with <laughs> infinite humor, uh, but we'll just give him the last word here. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, it was a rather long paper. I tried to say it a lot, and that's why there's so many footnotes in it. <laughs> um, you know, my, my prayer for this uh, talk, uh, and I've been thinking about it for quite some time, months, uh, is that it would bear fruit. Uh, I realize that that may not be visible to me. God's the only one who sees the fruit, but that's the goal. Um, I, I would like all of us to leave here with a deeper sense that um, walking with God is the best life that we can lead, uh, and that we would, uh, in cooperation with God, do what he's called us to do, uh, such that the outcome of our lives, however long they are, whatever they're involved in, uh, cannot be reasonably explained by human activity alone, but uh, can only best be explained by the work of God in each one of our lives.
to accomplish what could not possibly be accomplished without divine uh, assistance. Uh, that would be uh, my hope and wish for all of us. That's a good word. Please join me in thanking Dr. Roberts and the panel.